welcome to episode seven of Nuked Radio. I am Radchick. With me today is Jules and Miss Milky the Clown. We are going to run down some news stories for you guys, and then we want to talk about signs of radiation contamination in your area, things that you could look for in nature that might indicate that you have some contamination laying around. Um, I wanted to talk about the weather, though, real quick. I went to do the forecast last night, and Intellicast was showing snow all the way down to the Mexican border, and I'm like, that can't be right, Um, but it is. They had some crazy weather going on out there, and that cold front is going to hit the warm front that um, Jules and and Miss Milky and I are in today. Is Chicago supposed to be 85? Louisville, 86. Jules, I think around by you, I saw it was going to be like 76. Yeah, it's been it's been in the mid 70s here already for the last five or six days. I think next week they said 80s. Yeah, there's some pot- some potential though for some really bad weather along that line where those those two areas, the hot and the cold, are going to meet and probably like south texas and louisiana oklahoma arkansas they could even have some tornadoes uh today from that so um the forecast will be on the top of fukushima facts and i have it posted on youtube and on my facebook page and because of the recent geiger readings that have been coming out high even in areas where there isn't a jet stream overlay the watch is going to kind of just be for all areas of precipitation and i hate to do that because i don't want to desensitize people to the problem but um you know based on that like it's i think it's a prudent decision just to treat everything like there's possible fallout for right now and over the next couple of days we'll see what kind of readings come in and see if that's still staying true and Jules I looked into that yesterday we were talking about what xenon and krypton decays into Mm -hmm. and you were right xenon decays into cesium and krypton decays into strontium Oh. and so you know that's that's what they were measuring um, five times higher in Japan just over the, the last few days. Even at the very beginning, I mean, that's what we got hit with right after the incident. Those um, atmospheric maps, I believe, were uh, xenon and um, iodine, weren't they? Those, yeah. Those early ones? From yeah, and there's, there's something else that can happen, too, that Potter Blog had actually um, talked about or predicted would happen about two months ago when we had a lot of sun activity and flares that if you already have high atomic weight fallout in the atmosphere and the sun flares hit it it can cause it to decay back into or it's not decaying it's actually called spallation uh, into iodine 131 and based on where um the way the earth was facing at the time and the readings that were coming out of europe he predicted that would happen in europe and it did yeah, I read that article, and um, that was kind of where I had received the information about the xenon and the cesium because of those flares. And I guess uh, there are some holes. I mean, we know that we have ozone holes, but there were some magnetosphere holes also. And he was saying that all of that solar radiation and the proton storms and the electron storms that we were having were coming in through the magnetosphere holes. And he had said that it was going to cause some of this more inert gas to start turning into more dangerous um, particulate and falling out over us. Uh-huh. And yeah, and you know, I mean, he's, he was basing all that on theory, and he was right. I mean, you know, that's the problem. Like, waiting around data to become available can take months and years, and we've never been faced with anything like this before. We've never had this much contamination floating around in our air. So we have to, you know, kind of have uh, new and creative ways of dealing with it. And, you know, sometimes that involves speculating on on what's happening or what could happen. But definitely check out his site if you're on YouTube. It's P-O-T-R-B-L-O-G. We were talking about The Abyss, too, that movie, and I looked that up last night to see, like, who the actors were in it and if any of them had died but it turned out that the containment building they had filmed it in was at the Cherokee nuclear power plant in Saffney, South Carolina and they never finished that project so I guess it was right after it had been built they used it to film a movie there 
Oh, so they never had, uh, <laughs> it was never a live power plant. No, thank goodness. We had a couple of earthquakes, too, um, just in the last few hours, right off the Oregon coast, a 3.0 and a 3.7. Yeah, I saw that. Um, yesterday, they had, late last night, um, there were three in Central Cali. They were like uh, 2.5, 2.7, and a 2.5. And I saw that there were a couple in Nevada, a 2 and a 3 point something, which we don't see those too often. And then this morning, um, oh, and there was one in Hawaii. And then this morning, I saw the three, two or three up in Oregon. So there is some movement on our West Coast. Yeah, there's a few happening around Puerto Rico right now, too. Kind of where the, the plate extends along that trench. Yeah, they, they have them there pretty often there. But I haven't seen them there in a few weeks. Yesterday we were talking about, too, like the, some of the high readings that were coming out of Canada and the U.S. over the weekend. And I checked your DEP when we uh, got done with the show yesterday. And it turns out iodine-131, cesium-134, and 137 were all being detected around Croatia and Slovenia. And there were some high gamma readings in France, too. And France has been having a problem with at least one of its reactors that I know of. There's a guy, though, that covers Europe really well on YouTube. His name is ArcLight2011. And I see him posting on, on any news all the time also. And he does a really good job of breaking down what's going on in Europe. So you might want to check him out. Something a lot of people don't know is that nuclear reactors can also be used to manufacture precious metals. It's a process called nuclear transmutation or synthesis. And some of the metals that you can produce in a nuclear reactor are gold, silver, platinum, osmium, iridium, ruthenium, rhodium, and palladium. And rhodium used to be the world's most expensive metal at $10,000 an ounce. Now it's around the same price as gold. Did you know that, Jules? I didn't. Um, that's pretty nuts, though. I mean, also uh, with the radioactive metals, because they closed many of the low-level recycling plants here in the U.S. for recycling uh, radioactive metal, like um, remember in Texas last year when they discovered that all of that water had been radioactive and the radioact the pipes that it had been running through were radioactive. There was no place for them to dispose of those pipes. <clears throat> And so one of the warnings has been to keep your eye out for um, especially things from like uh, dollar stores or secondhand stores or whatever, objects made out of some of this recycled radioactive metal. And that's a good segue into your tissue boxes. Weren't you going to talk about that today? Yeah, well, because we, we wanted to bring people up to speed on some of the things that have, have happened in the past year, one of the big stories that hit mainstream was that radioactive tissue boxes were found in Bed Bath & Beyond. The New York State Department of Health yanked several tissue boxes off Bed Bath & Beyond shelves after they were found to be radioactive. The Dual Ridge Boutique metal boxes were found to contain small amounts of cobalt-60, which can cause cancer with prolong prolonged exposure. And would you say it was like a chest x-ray like every eight hours every eight hours is what they said and i believe too cobalt 60 is something that they use for chemotherapy yeah they use it a lot in medicine and the thing is it's highly unlikely that it had anything to do with fukushima but this is yet another one of these problems that come out of using nuclear materials is the way that they're being disposed of and it's used a lot in medicine and some of the stuff goes into uh, scrap yards and then it gets melted down and made into other things. And I don't have any idea what kind of like applications that has as far as like um, guidelines in the US, but in other countries they are probably not as stringent as we would be here. And these came from Asia. And what's interesting is they actually got through customs in New Jersey without setting off any detectors. They ended up setting off a detector at a truck stop when they were almost to California. So they came in through New Jersey and went all the way across the country. And we are back with Nuked Radio. 
Jules was just making a point about the uh, scrap, metal scrap. Yeah, um, like I was saying before the break, because many of the low-level radioactive waste um, dumps have been closed in this country, there there is no place for people to take uh, radioactive scrap metal. And so a lot of it is ending up in the landfills. And, um, and they even warned a while back, and this was a mainstream, to keep your eyes open for, like, silverware or can openers or things of that nature. They've been finding these items, when they've run a Geiger counter over them, to be quite radioactive. So, wow. you know, you never know. And these were brand new items purchased in the store. Well, I've got a story open here from Bloomberg. Radi- nuclear risks at Bed Bath & Beyond show hidden danger of scrap. Radioactive items used to power medical, military, and industrial hardware are melted down and used in goods, driving up company costs as they withdraw tainted products and threatening the public's health. India and China were the top sources of radioactive goods shipped to the U.S. through 2008. So, I mean, this has been going on for a while. And those of us who have Geigers, I guess, take it with you to the store, even when you just go to Bed Bath & Beyond. Yeah, they Um, don't like when you do that. (laughs) I took mine to the grocery store and followed your lead the other day, and uh, nobody saw me, thank God, but I'm walking around, like, scanning lettuce and stuff, trying to, like, keep it really close to me. And they, asked me they asked me not to bring it into the store at my grocery store, but, you know, that's my right to check if my food is contaminated or not. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's well, with it on mute, that's the good part. You, you know, people just think it's a cell phone. When I, when I brought it on the airplane, I put it through the... Um, x-ray machine and the guy took forever looking at it i'm like oh boy oh boy oh boy and um and then it came out and he's like whose is this i go it's mine and he goes well something happened in the machine we've got to send it through again i'm like oh boy (laughs) and it came out and he didn't say anything he must have thought it was a cell phone too bad you couldn't have had it on and running when you walked through the scanner well i didn't walk through i just opted out out I, I, I didn't walk. Oh, I see what you mean. I, I was like, we were talking about the whole body scanner. Um, no, I did the little arch thing. Yeah. A uh, story posted on Any News today. The Daily Show is going nuclear. Starting today, nuclear industry will show ad campaign that claims to show value of atomic power, trying to target younger audience. And I noticed uh, an ad during the Super Bowl. It was actually a beer commercial that was talking about our energy needs with nuclear and how it helps drive the turbines in the beer plants. What? (laughs) Come on. Yeah. When they're trying to get, like, mainstream football-watching, beer-drinking America to, like, totally Uh be behind nuclear power? Is that what that is? Yeah. Well, they they pay big money for these PR campaigns and, and trying to spin it to show how much we need it. Weren't they rewriting all the, the textbooks in Japan, too? Remember when that first happened? They were writing, rewriting all the textbooks in the schools in Japan to uh, give a more positive spin to nuclear energy. Mm-hmm. Like, all these poor kids are being irradiated, and they're going to try to tell them how it's good for them. We could probably do a show just on that, on the rewriting of textbooks and what our kids are being taught, but it's another off-the-topic Subject. Also on Informable today, that is Lucas Whitfield Hickson's site I had mentioned yesterday. Fukushima whitewash betrayed trust of NPR listeners. And we talked about this Friday with Miss Milky. And I said, you know, how do you feel you're actually giving the public better information than NPR? Because NPR ran a story saying that if your skin got burned from high level contamination or fallout, that there was no injury to your health which is just total bs yeah and i've been i've been sending them articles for a year and they just won't talk about it on there and when you try to trace back like who does the company financials they post a link for you to look at it to see who who supports npr financially the link's dead it's a 404 oh nice i'm sure that wasn't intentional By the way, Lucas does a great site. Um, I actually started watching him um, and the stuff he was posting back last March. And um, 
His site is now transformed into Informable, I think it's called, right? Yeah. Informable. And um, he's awesome. I've messaged him quite a few times um, in regards to things that I found or like um, the radiation network when we were getting some spikes in the very beginning. And uh, he has always been extremely responsive and a really nice guy. So definitely a site to check out. Um, he's on Facebook also. Yeah, he does a great job with the Freedom of Information Act request that he's been uh, getting um, audio transcripts from the NRC and transcribing them and posting them on his site of what they were talking about in the early days of the disaster. Yeah, and how and, much and, they knew <laughs> and never and, said anything. And, right, and they know that they're being taped. And there was, uh, you know, an area in one of the tapes where they didn't want to talk about the iodine exposure to babies in California. That was that was really upsetting to me. Um, Arnie Gunderson was just in Tokyo for the one-year anniversary of Fukushima, and all five samples that he took qualified as radioactive waste. So people walking around Tokyo are actually walking on top of radioactive waste. And it was so high that it would actually have to be buried in, like, in uh, fortified concrete. You know, because normally they, radioactive waste is put into, um, like, huge concrete depositories in the ground that have to be stable or can't be any kind of, like, uh, groundwater or steam that would cause the, the it to break down and then they're lined. But they would actually have to use, like, a fortified concrete where they mix it with epoxy. That's how high the levels are. And this was just five random areas that he checked. Is he back? Do you know? Did he make it back from Tokyo? I don't know. I don't know if he's back yet. I haven't uh, I haven't seen him on anything. Oh, Kevin, speaking of being back, Kevin Blanche put out another video yesterday. I know we were we were talking about uh, Kevin yesterday as to how things went. I don't know, did you see it? Yeah. Um so they told him he's okay, but I don't think he's believing them that he's doing, you know, they said that he's doing pretty well. I thought he said he's going back in for more chemo. Yeah. Ms. Milky, did you see the video? I Yeah, it, there were actually two of them. Uh, he has like a partially collapsed lung and something else, but the uh, test results that he got back that he was really uh, nervous about um, on Friday, they came back remarkably good. So I don't know what you would consider and the rebound or whatever. But. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people commented under the, the show. I uploaded the show to YouTube, and all the links to previous shows are, are on the uh, homepage of Orion, on, uh, on the Ratchet page where the guys are in chat right now. And so you can listen to the shows there where they're archived or on YouTube. And I've been posting the links on Facebook, too, and a lot of people commented under there. They really, you know, hope he does well and... Uh, some of them were, were putting in also, you know, some, some detox ideas for for him to do to help get rid of the cancer as well through diet and so forth. Canada looks like is having some problems. Bruce Power, which is right on Lake Huron, shut down after leak during reactor restart. And this was posted on March 19th. I'm going to make some changes too. The unit will remain shut down while the leak is investigated and steps are taken to prevent a recurrence. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission says there was no release to the environment. Of course, there just happens to be a lot of sturgeon washing up in that area, too, I've heard. We will be back shortly. You're listening to Nuked Radio. There was a, a video stream last night from the JNN camera that looked like black smoke or fog, and I, I watched it a couple times, and I, I really don't think that it's from the plant. I think that it was just a, a fog that was kind of rolling in front of the camera, and it didn't have a light on it, so it, it looked black and it looked really scary, but um, I don't think that it really had anything to do with any releases. And the only way that we're going to know is if we look at the, the Geiger readings around Japan today anyway. So I'll take a look at those later, and then we'll update it tomorrow. Uh, Ms. Milk, you had mentioned there was another leak at another plant in Japan. Here. Yeah, it's okay. It uh, leaked 1.5 uh, uh, tons of radioactive water. Camera that looks like black smoke or fog, and I, I watched it a couple times, and I, I really don't think that it's from the plant. I think that it was just a, a fog that was kind of rolling in front of the camera. 
Um, sh- I think we have Shane on the line. Shane, you need to turn your speakers down. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Hi, Shane. Hey, guys. You have a question? Or a comment? Yeah, you know, are, are we on now? Yes, we are. Okay. Well, you know, I hear everyone saying all the nuts and bolts about everything on the radiation. And, and you know, that's all cool beans and everything, how to prepare our physical bodies and everything. But uh, I'm wondering when someone here is going to take up the rope on pulling in the esoterical version of this, if, if, if you're understanding what I'm saying here. Um, actually, no. What, 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 uh, what do you mean by that? Well, it's definitely a little bit out there, just like I am, because that's why I am in saying Shane. But I look at it this way. You know, I understand that, you know, the nuclear, the plutonium or whatever, it's just a bunch of alchemy thrown together, minerals, this, that, and whatever that we found in the earth and put it together. I'm just kind of wondering here if maybe in a way we are not like kind of the Elohim or something that has created a new life form because everything's got spirit. And if we made some kind of a radiation and it's got power just like the sun does, what is not to say that it doesn't have a life form going on, intelligence of its own? consciousness you mean like terraforming or transformation transmutation i guess i don't really understand your question (laughs) look at it as if we have created life is what i'm trying to say well there are actual life forms that have been noticed recently that have never been documented before and and what i'm talking about is some uh a spider web like substance that was determined to be biological in origin that was found on um, in a storage pool I believe in South Carolina recently and they're currently analyzing it to find out if the radiation had actually mutated um, this biological source into something new and, and I haven't seen anything that said what the outcome of those tests are but I guess it's a possibility We may see all kinds of things that we weren't expecting out of this because we've never been faced with anything like this before. And a lot of radioactive elements we have around us in nature where there's uranium in the ground. In fact, in the 1960s, you could get paid big money by going around with a Geiger counter and finding some of these uh, uranium veins uh, because the the country needed it um, to, you know, develop their arsenal and so forth. I have one of those old Geiger counters. But the problem is that once these materials are put into a nuclear reactor, uranium actually becomes a million times stronger than what it is out in nature. And that's what we have blowing around, and that's what we have that's landed over here. And, and we won't know the extent of the contamination until we have a full-scale soil survey that's done in this country and that's going to take years and and thousands of people to do it and you know the few researchers and and some of them are doing this on their own time they're not getting paid they are are trying to put together you know information and data about this you know i i can only think of like maybe 10 people and and that are, are really working on this problem and you know we need to do everything we can to support their efforts even if that means we're just taking pictures of mutations that we see and posting them on Facebook and sending these pictures to researchers so they can you know put the data together and we kind of have to do this on the fly so we can yeah. figure out what's going on because the the downside you know is, is the potential to to really harm the health of our children and our children had enough problems that they were going to need to deal with already with the economy and, and everything else that's going on on top of this problem. Correct, correct. I, I'm smelling on what you're stepping in. There's no doubt there. But like you say, like you say with the algae growing up in them ponds now, I wonder if it in, in, in the natural world, I understand uranium is found naturally, but just like sugar, sugar's natural too. And then until we process it and alchemize it and put our energies in whoever knows what kind of nefarious energies may be put into it, I'm thinking maybe it has created or became its own conscience life form and maybe it's seeing what we're doing and going on around here is little vermin ants that are just tearing this beautiful blue marble up and with all of these uh nuclear star- sites r- reactors and generators farting in a burping i think something's going on and, and i really think it may be out there but uh you know what else is there left to think of sometimes in an insane world as it is you know Hey, Shane, you just brought up a good point. You were talking about algae. I forgot to tell you guys about this. Um, 
So this weekend, I uh, I took a road trip, and um, on top of my pool, which of course has been closed all winter, nobody used it last season because I would not let anyone go into the pool full of radioactive fallout. Um, there is some pretty messed up looking algae grown on top. And I've had a pool my whole life. You know, I've seen many different incarnations of uh, spring algae growing on pools. This stuff was messed up. It was this really strange green in some of the bunches. Some of the other bunches were this really mottled like uh, brown and red. And then there were other chunks that looked like, I mean, for lack of a better term, like mucus. It was disgusting. And they were living like in separate colonies in the pool. And then there were a couple colonies that had all grouped together. So I want to see if maybe I can suck some of that out of the pool water. You know, it's all floating on top, so it's not like it's it's in the bottom. But um, And have that tested because it looked like mutant algae to me. The blob. The blob, yes. <laughs> Just waiting for it to come out in the dark and grab me. Uh, I want to read you guys a quote from Chris Busby. He put out a video yesterday. It's actually a, a YouTube lecture called Einstein Politics and Reality. And, and this is the, the beginning of the video. I met an awful lot of physicists as I've been doing this work on ionizing radiation and health. And I have to say that they are a pretty dumb bunch. They are not at all really like scientists. They are more like technicians, I guess. They apply equations that someone else hands them. They read books and they follow rules. And these rules are laid down <clears throat> by theories which eventually track back to the Institute of Radiological Protection, which applies physics to living systems. And of course, you can't apply physics to living systems. It's a problem. But what physics has done in the last century is it's taught human beings to give way to impossible ideas on the basis that they must be right, on the basis that mathematics says they are right. And this is the most extraordinary thing is that has left everyone powerless to use their own common sense and their own understanding of the world as they live in it. And I thought that was a really amazing quote and kind of yeah. uh, reiterates what we're talking about here, that it's, you know, we kind of need new and creative ways of wrapping our brains around this problem in, in many different areas. Yeah, I mean, it's... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he went on to say something to the effect of um, there's so much margin of error, you know, plus or minus this or that, that um, that the answers that they come up with cannot possibly be right because it's all based on a numeral, numer a number equation. And if you have a huge margin of error, there's no possible way you can say definitively yes or no. It's like we're living in the twilight zone right now with all of us, to be honest. It's our world. All right, well, we're heading into the last break, and when we come back, we're going to run through the list of signs of high contamination in your area. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Uh, the sunsets were purple and red and yellow on fire. The clouds would catch the colors everywhere. That's it. And we are back for the last segment of Nuked Radio. Uh, a couple people that were asking about the opening song. It's called Chick Habit by April May, and it was on a Tarantino soundtrack. I think it was on the Planet Terror or the other movie that was with it in Grindhouse. Um, we wanted to talk about Leopard Spot Fallout. This was something um, that was noticed um, from Chernobyl, and I always tell people if you want to understand what's going on with Fukushima, study Chernobyl first. And if you look at aerial views of where they mapped out contamination, the contamination tends to, like, drop and clump together. But I don't mean in clumps like a clump of flowers. I mean over a big area. But when you're looking at it from the air, you know, it can um, um, be a sp spread like a, a mile or so and then have areas in between those where there isn't any. And that's because of bioaccumulation because these uh, particles are drawn together by their electrical charge. 
In Chernobyl, something that was widely noticed was uh, black or brown mushroom growth and lots of proliferation of mushrooms. And if you walk around in like low-lying areas where you live or around streams and so forth, if you have contamination, you may notice a lot of fungus growth from that. Um, but but black or brown is is usually the type of mushroom that's affected. Absence of earthworms when it rains, and something that's normal for my area is uh, earthworms just be everywhere after a rainstorm, and all last summer we didn't have any, and I think I mentioned on a previous show that I had reports from other people in Iowa and Nebraska saying their earthworms were okay if they dug down into the uh, dirt in their barns, but that they didn't have earthworms outside. Did you Pine about trees. the radioactive earthworms in Japan? Well, I heard about those, and they were quite a distance away from Fukushima, weren't they? Like yeah, 100 kilometers, yeah. and they had like yeah. 90,000 becquerels yeah, of crazy. radiation. Um, pine trees, there was something called red forest syndrome that was widely observed around the reactor in Chernobyl. And it's where the, the pine trees, the deciduous, the, the ones that keep their needles, actually turned red from the outer branches inward. And the whole tree looked like that in Chernobyl, but I started noticing that happening around here in July. And that was like the first time that I called Arnie Gunderson was to ask him about this. And it, it's the area where I live. Um, I, I have a retention pond behind my house and everything kind of like drains into that area. And the pine trees all around me are doing this. And when I've driven, um, I had to go to a funeral across the state a few months ago. I noticed there were, were wide areas where for a few miles, all the trees look fine. And then for the next couple miles, <clears throat> all the pine trees are turning red. And there is a, a pine beetle that um, has been out west. And they're really concerned about it this year, too, because it never got really cold enough to, to kill off these, these pine beetles like they usually do that they were going to really proliferate and spread. And if the the pine tree is dying from these beetles, these beetles will actually leave these little tubes on the bark where they go into the tree. And so if you have a pine tree that looks sick, you can look at the trunk of the tree, and if you see these tubes, then it's probably an insect problem. If you don't see the tubes, it could be cesium uptake in your soil. And if you suspect that that's going on, you can contact Fairwinds, and they will tell you how to take a soil sample and send it in to them for testing. Another thing that I've noticed that really bothered me is since last summer, there's been a lot of dead animals around here. And usually when animals are going to die, they go into a dark place and they hide. But these animals are just dying out in the open. And I've seen dead Canadian geese, dead deer, dead squirrels, dead birds, and it's like they're having heart attacks. They're just one, the squirrel died on the steps to my house. Oh my God. Yeah, it was a, a little dead bird baby on our red. patio yesterday. It was a little baby red squirrel that oh. was in those pine trees that are turning red. Oh, that's sad. Obviously, mutations of plants are animals, and plants that uptake a lot of water and have rapid cell divisions such as lilies, dandelions, and other weeds, fruit trees, and I've got lots of pictures of mutated fruit on Mutation Watch. I, dump, I put the link in the, uh, in the chat box before the show. Tree saplings, because they grow fast. If you spot any of these things, especially in the spring, you're going to want to photograph them or shoot some video, upload it to YouTube, put mutations in the title, post it on Mutation Watch on Facebook, and we'll try to get you an address where you can send either the picture or a sample of the plant if you have it. And if you notice like a, an oak tree sapling growing or a weed growing and one of the weeds looks really strange and the other ones look like what you normally expect them to, I would take a sample of both and take it to your local nursery. Around us, we have bordines. I, I don't know what's in other parts of the country, but you know these experts could, could say, hey, you know this really is odd. So you're not wasting your time or wasting the researcher's time if it is something like a normal variant. But it's unlikely. You know, a quick question for Shane. I mean, I'll um, 
four of us are up in the northern part of the U.S., but are you seeing some of the same stuff there, Shane? You know, things are seeming to look pretty good here, especially with the warmer weather and stuff. I, I can tell you one thing. My uh, my rose bush right next to the house, it never lost its, gr- its green leaves all winter long. I couldn't believe it. I just kept looking at it every day and just thinking, boy, something is really wrong here. And then the, the sun was just so strong when it should have been the weakest. I mean, I was sitting by my back door window getting a suntan in the, in the winter, and I just i have never felt it that strong. So I think there's a lot of crazy energies coming off the sun. I think a lot of things are going down, and, and, and I think your show needs to go on for more than a month. But I think if we all just prepare ourselves with knowledge and live in love, I think we're all going to be all right, guys. I really do. I think so, too, and we're all helping each other. Like, we're all learning together. I mean, this is really a great opportunity for, for people to share with each other. Um, but you brought up a good point, too, is the energy from the sun. And we've been getting, you know, just hit with, like, proton and, and gamma events from some of these flares. And what I noticed a lot around here last year, too, last summer, was plant death. And I couldn't help but notice, um, you know, the hot particle pictures of lung tissue and apes that Arnie Gunderson had posted, what a heart, how a hot particle uh, radiates the tissue around it. There were leaves on trees everywhere around here that had these black spots. And some people were attributing that to a fungus. But, you know, radiation can also mutate a fungus. But I had never seen that before. And it was, like, on all the trees. And this funeral that I had driven across the state to go um, to, go to uh, which was my aunt got leukemia and died in three weeks in August from the time she found out till the time she was dead there were people that came from all over the country because my family's really spread out some of them were from north from northern ontario some of them were from vancouver and they were all seeing the same things in the trees by them too and you know chemtrails gets brought up a lot you know the monsanto thing um and i i really don't know that much about monsanto um uh, we have some other experts on orion that uh, know a lot more about that. But, you know, these things could all be affecting the plants, but we need these plants for our quality of air. And it's very disturbing to see, you know, regardless of where it's coming from, why are these plants dying like this? You know, watch, I do... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Watch the um, the series on YouTube called the Wor- <clears throat> excuse me, The World According to Monsanto. That is a must-watch. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. I was going to say, I do know a lot about Monsanto, and that's an interesting point, though. You know, I mean, Monsanto is genetically modifying all these different um, plants at a DNA level, and they're creating things that have never been created in nature before. I mean, Dr. Huber, um, he's a... He's a pathologist that studies plants and animals, and he's been finding that... um, it appears that some of the genetically modified crops are putting off this the substance. It's not a bacteria. It's not a virus. It's not a fungus. They're not really sure what it is. And he's called it a new life form. But, you know, how is the radiation going to affect this new life form? You know, I mean, we really could be seeing some, um, some sci-fi stuff here in the future with GMO. And we just don't know. Another thing, too, that's uh, been widely reported in in Japan as well is um, that berries and flowers and vegetables grow huge. And there's lots of pictures of smiling Japanese holding these gigantic sweet potatoes. (laughs) I have some of those on on Mutation Watch, too, or a good place to go to look at at some of the, um, the plant mutations is Fukushima Diary. He's been posting them on there for a while, and he actually posted some fish with two heads from Nebraska uh, about two weeks ago. And, you know, Nebraska's had all those problems with Fort Calhoun and Cooper, and we really don't know what the status is of those plants because Obama had declared a, a blackout on the news. And one other thing, too, that, and this is just my theory, atmospheric anomalies. Last summer, um, I saw lightning that was hot pink and purple in color, and it was the first time I had ever seen that, and and just knowing that there's an electrical charge to the rads and that they're up in the air, I don't know how those could be affecting these things. And there was something else that was widely observed, um, not only in in Michigan, but in Naples, Florida, of these 
rays that go from one side of the horizon to another. I and think just, we're, we're coming up on the end here, Christina. Okay. So that's the list. I've got a couple of videos on YouTube of clues in nature that goes pretty much over the same thing, um, but in a little more detail. If you guys want, check those out. We're looking to getting some spider warts. That's nature's Geiger counter. If there's contamination in your area, the flowers will be pink instead of purple. And we'll be back tomorrow, same time. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Thank you, Jules. Thank you, Miss Milk. At Orion News Talk, we know times are bad. Ever since 9-11, a battle has been waging against we the people. Our Constitution is under attack. A clandestine war has been launched against this country and the world. The Federal Reserve Cartel has bankrupted our nation and destroyed our economy. 